Well, hello, and Salvador Fandino. Um, my company, we work, we write a lot of network coding, networking code, and system administration code. So we use an event a lot, and this uh, I'm going to talk about my experience working uh, event driving programs, uh, how to do them, uh, how, how to produce my enable code. And how to use my one of my models as class state machine. Okay. I'm going to start from, uh, from the ast more abstract part of the problem, and then going to coding and this more practical. So, I'm driving programming. Well, this is the, the Wikipedia definition. I'm not going to going to over it because I think everybody knows what event programming is. But mostly there are two parts: one event selection. That's the main loop, the, the part of the code that uh, look for things happening and tell your code that something happening. And then there is, when you know that something has happened, how to, to react to that. That's the event handling part. And with any event, uh, you have an event that's the main loop, the, the part that takes care of detecting things happening. And then for event handling, you use callbacks, right? And the callbacks are very simple to use, very straightforward. You don't have almost no learning, learning uh, curve. It's, it's very easy. Also, they're very flexible because you can do almost anything. But on the other hand, once your program gets start getting bigger and bigger, uh, you end having a lot of spaghetti code, right? For a simple structure, the usual structure top-down program, it's like the program flow is very easy to follow, right? Hello? So, so looking at your code, it's very easy to see how your flow is going from subroutine to subroutine. Or uh, It doesn't matter if it's uh, object-oriented programming. It's the same. You have methods then, but uh, programs are very easy to follow. But when you have callbacks, uh, you never know how your uh, program flow goes from one point to the other, and uh, it can be pretty crazy following it. So, um, in the structure program, you, you have components with APIs that you define for maintainability and easy to use. But when you have uh, uh, driving programming, you, you have to, to uh, divide your program by the non-blocking, I mean non-blocking uh, entities. So it's uh, there is no high level or low level or right. It's, it's, there is a lot of small blocks that you call uh, one calling the other. Sorry. Um, And so it's very difficult to, so, to follow the, the flow of your program. And another problem is keeping a state. Because if you have a structured programming, you can use lexical. So you have uh, delimited entities where you put your data. And you don't have to make things global unless it's uh, I mean, in just in very few cases. But if you are using uh, event driving programming, uh, your small blocks have to pass a lot of information from one to the next. So you have to use global. So uh, put it then in objects or disclosures, it's very much difficult. So, on the other side, we have state machines. And I suppose every know, everybody knows what state machine is, but uh, briefly, for a state machine, you have states and events that trigger transitions and make the state machine move from one state to the other. That's the theoretical part. In practice, you also have actions. That's the the things that interact with the outside world. When you want some state machine to do something, you have to run some code at some given points. Or, um, for instance, when you enter, the state machine enters on some states or leave it, or when some transition happens, or just when some event in general happens. Right? So, event driving, programming, and state machines are a good fit. It's very convenient to use. Uh, state machines to make event driving programs maintainable, right? Because uh, 
with the steam machines you can every steam machine is an object. So you can have in a event driving program several steam machines that work as agents uh, that run in parallel, right? And you can use some domain specific language to represent that stage machine and define them. So and and the flow between the state machine states define the, the flow in your program. Then you only have to uh, the the actions in the well the, the, the blocks of code that you were using for perform, to perform actions in your event driving code become the, they become the actions of the state machine. Right? Uh, for instance, this is this a popular model of CPAM that uh, does implements state machine form for Po for the Po framework. Right? It's this first time is an implement a sample implementation of a, a console application. And there are several models on CPAN supporting state machines. And, but when I was looking for one, no, no one was a perfect fit for my requirements because a lot of them are too abstract or basing the theoretical uh, papers and things like that, and, or do something very specific like parsing or a specific to some framework like in the example of point A to Po. And a lot of them are not very efficient. Right? So uh, a long time ago I write this class state machine for another thing. But when I started um, doing event driving programming, I, I thought that it was a, a, a good fit for my for my problem. So class state machine is a life framework for implementing very efficient state machines. When I wrote it at the beginning Efficiency was one of my primary concerns. Right? And was focused on event driving and networking applications. It was generic, it could be used for passing, for instance, but, but network applications was the thing that moved me to, to do it. It's very low level. So it, it's more like a building block, right? And it just supports event dispatching. It knows nothing about transitions or declaring how to move from one state to other. You have to do that by coding. And, but on the other side, it was a very sophisticated blend between object-oriented programming and state machines. It's uh, <coughs> difficult to explain that, but you can define a state in, in several places. And and it will go and respect the hierarchy on the classes and, and blend the, how the events are displaced in, from one place to the other. In the inside, this implementation is, was scary because the limitations of per five at that time. Today, it has evolved a lot mostly by my requirements. I, I want to do things, I, how can I modify my, my class to do that? Has a lot of bells and whistles. Um, but it's still a low-level framework. Uh, now internally use the MRO feature in, C in Perl. I think it's the only model in CPAN that use it for something real, apart from the C3. And there is also a companion Model that's class state machine declarative that allows to define state machines at the higher level. So this is a example of how to use class state machine. So the thing is that it defines a, an attribute for some routines that allow to to say uh, for every state they call it to run when some method is called. So if I say in, in this soup that I want this to print high and this is by, when I call it from one state, it's going to uh, to dispatch to the correct subroutine, right? And it does it very efficient, very fast.
And this is the principal building block on glass stain machine. Under the hood, it just replaces objects from one class to other, and it builds classes on the fly. For every state of every class, it builds a, a new uh, package in parallel, and, and then it changes the objects from one class to the other dynamically as state change. It uh, also has uh, some methods that it calls automatically, like enter state or leave state when the state changes. That this is more on the wish and uh, bells and whistles part. Right. And so I, I found that class state machine was really too low level to. It was very useful, it was very fast, but when programming it, it was not uh, requiring lots of code and boilerplate code to do things, uh, basic things. Right. So I will and write class system machine declarative. That's a high level framework within top of class state machine and that allows to build state machines declarative. Uh, Code clarity and manageability was my primary concern. And I, I have used it to build really complex state machines with tens of states, maybe 30 or 40 state machine, states. Uh, and it works for me quite well, but uh, I mean, I don't know about your problem because this is still a, a work in progress, right? And I'm still learning a lot how to structure code and what things are required in a class state machine. In a, a state machine declaration uh, framework to be productive, productive and generate maintainable code. So the way to use it is very simple. You just have to, to build, uh, to start building a class that they are is based, based on class state machine, and then use class state machine declarative to define the states of the state machine and the transitions and the events that it accepts. For instance, the, this is the, the basic feature you, you have. A state name, you can define what to do when the state is centered, when, what to do when it's leave, and the transitions where you put for every event that can come to the, that state, the target state where you want to move, right? So this, this allowed to write the, uh, define the basic state machine flow. It's an example for the class that was shown before using O and FA. Um, well, I'm not going to go over it. Also, there are things that are more complex. More, more, yeah. For instance, the states can be derived. So you have one state, inside one state you can define sub states that uh, get all the properties of the state, but that can uh, be um, ref refined. Uh, this is useful, for instance, when you have a lot, lot of states, but uh, you want to introduce a structure into your code. It's a bit like, like the... Like that, right? Getting back to the, that structure, that when you have high level and a low level part. And this also in any state that's like universal for uh, object-oriented programming. It's a state that's derived for every other state. So you can put there a, a default transitions or default actions or whatever. <laughs> so other cables are advanced because my experience is very, most state machines uh, when you are in one state, you do some action and you can have two results. The action uh, went well or it failed. So it's very use, 
useful to be able to pass from one state to the other, to the next. Um, and that's what the advanced uh, cable does. Uh, when one machine re receives the 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 advanced uh, event, it just moves to the next state on the definition for the class state machine declarative uh, state list. Another interest feature is the before cable that allows to run actions before, before uh, some event triggers a transaction. So you want to run and to do things besides the the flow between the state, that the, what the state machine does by default. You you can put there in before. This is the improved version of the previous example where we have used the, the any state to declare that a default transaction that, that when we, the connection is closed, we move to the stop it state. We define that we, when we recite the on down event, we move to the next state. So we pass, for instance, for out to rep. Uh, we use also substates, so for instance, outs have two substates. One is slowing, that waits for your login, and PWDI, that waits for your password. So the thing is that uh, now you have two main states, and inside every state you have another two. And this is a structure, right? And two other cables I delay that allows. Sometimes it's very convenient to when you are in when your state machine is in some state and you get an event. You can maybe it's not convenient for you to handle that event at that point. So you can mark that event as delayed, and it will be uh, relaunched the, once the state machine moves to another state and the ignore cable that just ignores some event in, for some given state. So how does all fit? Or how has worked, what has worked for me? Right. What I have found is that uh, Using an event as is is too low level, so for me, the, the, in, in order to write maintainable, maintainable code, uh, I decide to use an annotation layer. That's one place where I put all the code that do, does some simple things, like for instance, reading a line from a socket or performing some RPC call or performing a query over a database. And on, on top of that, I use class state machine declarative to build state machines and with a small me methods that are just glue that call into the adaptation layer. Right. So, coming back over it again. The state machine declaration includes the state machine skeleton, how uh, the principal state machine flow, the states, and the transitions, and the high-level glue methods. That's, uh, these methods have to do things uh, just and ju just calling the adaptation layer. Uh, these classes uh, can also be used as agents, agents that are running your program in parallel. Right? In the adaptation layer, there are methods that implement functionality that are required by your state machines. And the good thing is that the adaptation layer usually in your programs is shared between a lot of state machines and a lot of state machine classes. So if you have an application that interacts with a database, you are probably going to have several uh, state machines, different state machines that perform different queries on your database, but you can handle all your dust queries with a simple or method in the adaptation layer. And this is the, the, the layer that goes into any event and really interacts with any event. 
And when I say an event, I mean an event or any of the models available from CIPA, from CIPA and that, like an event HTML or whatever. In order to bring maintainability code, for me the case, uh, the, the API between the adaptation layer and the state machine uh, declaration layer. Right? What has worked for me is to not but not pass callbacks from the state machine uh, declaration code to the uh, um, adaptation layer, but instead to use conventions and give the the, the events well known names as uh, on down on error. So I don't have to to keep passing uh, closer from one layer to the to the adaptation layer, and then use the the state machine objects as a black bar to push information. So uh, I can then use that information in in the following state. Uh, hopefully, I'm going to show you some code later, so it's going to make more sense than anything. And. Another thing that's important is that, that methods on the purple layer, the, the adaptation layer, should be flexible and feature rich. So, uh, uh, the as much as these methods get powerful, you, you reduce the code you put in the class definition, state machine definitions, and the glue code. So, um, when you add features and resources here, you are reducing the code you put in the upper layer. That's very important to get that, the, the code in the upper layer uh, minimal. Another thing that's interesting is that the purple layer might be a collection of, of compensable roles. So you can, for instance, if your state machines need to access a database, perform RPC queries, or uh, run external commands, any one of these tasks could be put in a role and you can uh, use that role from your uh, state machine <coughs> class. And so let's go over, over some sample code. This is uh, the, the sample of the console application uh, standard. Right? So. Right. This is a package for a, the, a console application. And, and, and this is the state machine that when you get some connection to your to the, to the program, uh, handles the authentication and running commands. So at the beginning, you see the class state machine declarative uh, declaration of the state machine, how the states and the transitions and the actions to be run. Uh, we use the advanced keyword to say that when every every time we have an undone event, we move to the next state. This is very convenient in order to to reduce the size of this definition because otherwise we will have to add uh, a transition inside every uh, state saying that when you get an undone event, you have to move to the next event. So we have a new state that the state you get when you create a new object of that class. And then we have an auth state, that's where you perform authentication of the user. And a REPL, that's where you read co uh, uh, commands from the, from the user and run them. Inside the auth state, there are two states. One's logging, another is P with the D. The, the first asks for the login and the second one asks for password. And then, we have a, a, a before definition that what it does is when we get the undone event, we, before doing the transition for the, that event, that will be from password to the web, it calls this method, check password. Then the replay, we have the ask substate, 
that's, that asks the user for a command to run, and then the run is substate that runs the command and waits for it to finish. Uh, another thing is, uh, for instance, here we have defined the on error uh, transition at the state level, so it gets used both from the ask substate and for the run substate. Then the thing here is trying to, to reduce code the size, making this declaration as small as possible, so it's uh, easy to follow. Uh, other things that are interesting here is that uh, the before call here on down, well, it can fail and invoke another event. So it can be short circuit. If this sends an error event, the undone event is not going to be delivered. Instead, it's going to go to the on error, follow the on error event, so it's going to be to the login substate again. And those are the small uh, glue methods that call into the adaptation layer that, call, that goes over an event. As you see, they are very simple and they just start some kind of um, um, of mini flow or, I mean, they are not really methods at all. They just, they just launch actions that run in the background. And all these functions, all these methods, and using some method that at the end is going to deliver an, an event. For instance, uh, in that case, we line reads a line and can return on down or on error. They get based on a save as argument that indicates in the object where the information has to be saved. That's one of the things I said before, that is using the, the object as a blackboard where you push information and so you can use it later in another block. For instance, when you get to check the password, right, uh, readline has saved in the first case the login as login, the password as PWD in the object, so we can just use it and check that they are right. If they are not right, we deliver a, another event that's self on error, and this aborts the undone transition and instead performs an on error transition. The as command works on the same. And the run command. Um, it checks its uh, quit or exit uh, command. See if it is, it just calls on exit. Otherwise, it calls into the adaptation layer to run the command. This code here is just uh, some code to be sure that once the connection is closed, uh, the object is disposed, it's uh, removed from memory. I'm going to show you now the adaptation layer. I have used it for that example. Well, here I have used it as a base class. I have not used roles, but this I could have done it the other way. And as I told you, that they are not uh, as much as methods, uh, as method chains. So you have real line method that actually calls into any event with a callback to, to the real line callback that then performs uh, read such a from the socket 
and when it sees that a new line is there, calls the undone. After saving the line in the what it has passed as save us. Uh, if something fatal happens, it calls on returns on closed. This is another of the, the things that I told you before that to use well known names, right? Here we are using the undone, on closed and other places are the on error. Then we have the, the wrong command method that has a star and a synchronous command on the background. Uh, use an event util run command, redirects the output to the socket, and just registers the run command call callback to be run when the, met the, the command finishes. And once it finishes, it returns the undone event. For completeness, I'm going to show you the, the wrapper script that does every, loads everything and, and makes it run. That's very <coughs> simple. Just use the demo CLI. CLI package starts a listener uh, and pass it to any event here. I think that's an error. Uh, so So when the listener gets a new socket, a new connection. It just starts a, a new demo CLI state machine and runs it. The important thing here is that, I mean, demo CLA package is, is very simple. I mean, it just has uh, some level, some the class, the state machine definition, and some simple methods that call uh, some methods on the adaptation layer. So it's easy to understand and to change and I mean, to maintain in general. I have another bigger sample, but I have no network connection and that there were things outside, so I'm going to skip that. And what are my conclusions here? Well, state machines are a very convenient way to just structure event driving programs. A class state machine is a mature, a low level, and efficient framework, but it's very low level. So. Things like class state machine declarative that are a work in progress, I think is very interesting. The three largest approach that I have presented is very effective. I have been able to build uh, applications that have something like 40 different state machines working in parallel inside and in objects it could be uh, more than uh, 2,000 in the same program running in parallel. But at the end, I think that there is still a lot of place for innovation here, that uh, we have to produce better tools to write event driving programs. Um, well, I hope somebody of you that, that do it. Um, that's all. Any questions? Yeah, yeah, I, I know what, what you mean. No, you, you can't. No, there's, there's not infrastructure for that. You, you have to declare it in, in 
in advance. But, but you can put a hook if you want um, statically and then use uh, some code to push it there. But as is, there is not infrastructure for that to support that functionality. Everything is static. Sorry? Uh, it's, the models are all in CPAN. Uh, otherwise, in GitHub. GitHub, Salva. Sorry, I'm not here. Can you speak a bit yeah. bit Yeah, the models are in CPAN, and the example code for the presentation is in GitHub. Everything is on CPAN. Below that, uh, um, parses of all the three definitions and builds a three that you can use for another thing. So for instance, I have a model to <coughs> generate graph bits presentation uh, diagrams, but I have found that the graph bits doesn't support this, the hierarchical states. It does, but very, it's very limited, and the diagrams are not very good looking. But you can use it. And for simple state machines, it really is very interesting. For the big guys, it's not so good. Uh, what was the other uh, Well, uh, then you have this uh, this model that's the, uh, I call it the builder, that parses the state machine definition, and you can hook there and perform whatever you want from there. And regarding the uh, tracing, the, the transitions, there is a debugging mode, but uh, it's not very important. You have a lot of information that's creepy. <laughs> uh, I can't follow it, but <laughs> it needs improving. Yeah? Sorry, uh, can you share a link to GitHub? GitHub, Salva, I think. Well, I have no connection to the hub, but it's... It's Salva, S-A-L-B-A. Type it into the address bar. I don't know it by him. So I think it's the last module available from there, the, that one, right? Everything is there. <laughs> Well, you, you can use for anything. I mean, the, the, there is not uh, any relation between class state machine. There is not relation between n class state machine and n event. Just a, I love an event, <laughs> so it's what I use. I found it's very convenient to, come, to use both classes together. Any other question? So I think we are all time, so thank you.